I'm here to relate to you and discuss uh, what our group uh, is uh, doing on fruit uh, physiology and quality. And this is uh, the reporting of uh, a group effort. In fact, as you can see, everybody in the group contributed to research and results. So, starting with a bit of uh, an introduction and on the new technology, a bit to what fruit maturity is about, and then a bit of a conclusion. So, the problem with the horticulture is uh, quite extensive for uh, our industry because there is the, the market is pretty stagnant due to higher production. To in, production is much higher than the demand, so there we have price stages, and then there is a high need to differentiate in the market, and um, therefore to try to reduce this uh, this pressure, we need to increase market selection, especially for Asia, but uh, there is a lot of competition in that one. Uh, there is a need for uh, improved quality and very high quality to be able to deliver uh, to a price that, that we can actually be competitive with, and uh, therefore there is the importance to of the consumers in the, in the entire picture, where the problem is that there is a high consumer dissatisfaction normally, and uh, the, the, the retailers currently dictate the quality that you currently find in uh, the supermarket when you go and buy the fruit. The consumer dis dissatisfaction becomes one of the most important parts of the entire picture, because poor or, inc or inconsistent fruit quality has uh, shown that uh, deters the consumers for buying that specific fruit for up to three weeks. First time that they are not happy, second time they actually get off of that particular fruit and most of the time of that particular species for the entire season. So it's an incredible loss of market when the fruit is actually not of the correct quality. So a consumer expects and desire and pretends consistent quality or he won't give the money. So to deliver something to consumers, currently the commercial supply chain has, I'm not going through all of the steps, but just to see, to show that there are several steps that they are involved. And they are toward, from the starting, toward the delivering it to the consumer. However, all of these steps are most of the time by themselves. They don't cater too much to the next step. Is whatever they get the fruit is their problem. And uh, the consumer at the end of the chain gets whatever it gets. Good, bad, it doesn't matter, it gets there, has to get whatever. And it doesn't have much of a choice. While our group is currently working on uh, new thoughts that uh, to have a value chain in horticulture. Normally, when you take uh, the, 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 the term value chain from business, that's where it's mostly coming from, you get that the, the value means because it is a value added. Horticulture is a difficult and different animal because our concept that we are trying to introduce is that actually is not added, is actually maintained. So what we actually are doing is trying to don't diminish it. Because whenever whatever the quality has the fruit and the harvest, that is whatever it is. It could be good, could be bad, it doesn't matter. But the only the goal is to actually keep whatever it is on and so that is the value added because you are able to don't drop it and you have to take decisions to what actually happens to that fruit and that requires a real time decision so the new concept that is actually taking over internationally as well is a value chain system approach to the quality where the consumer determines the the quality at the starting point so we need to know what the consumer wants and then all the different steps, they align to it to deliver back what the consumer is needed. But to do that, we, it's needed to have a common denominator, so we need to have a measurement where everything, actually, at every step along the chain is necessary to take a real-time decision and therefore understand what is the future of that particular fruit and its quality. So it guarantees consistent quality because you can identify at any time always what to do with that fruit. And you can choose the market at this point because you are able to identify and take a real-time decision. However, how and what we can use to do that currently is size, soluble sugars, 
firmness or sugar to acid ratio as a part of a consumer preference. There are several literature saying that. However, these are usually destructive and or have high problems in sampling and batching because they are dest destructive. If and when they are non-destructive, like for example NIR for sugar uh, identification, and they, they could be even portable now as new technology. However, they have a need of a constant calibration, at least yearly, and they have a huge problem of temperature effect on their results. And there is high variability of these particular components for possible identification of quality. These, don't get too hung up on it, this, but this just to show, this is actually results from John, is just to show that there is a high variability. Here we did an experiment on uh, nectarines, it was very early nectarines, the fruit were left on the plant completely up to full ripening and close to actually over matureness at this point, and we wanted to identify the effect and interaction between crop load, so how many fruit were on the plant, and um, the position. As you can see, there is a high variability and there is quite a bit of a gradient uh, in, uh, from top to bottom in size and in this case sugars as well. Um, this is to show that the, the crop load affected quite a bit of it. Lower crop load, lower, low, lower number of fruit on the plant diminished a bit and was, a bit too, was able to uh, overcome a bit the problem of the um, of the gradient, but not too much. So this translated in, uh, if we consider before, for example, one of the aspects of quality sugars, it translated in a high variability of what we can find in the fruit. And uh, as you can see, the gradient that was shown before is again present. Top, the top, the interesting part was came up that the top of the trees, they actually are not affected at all from the number of the fruit. This is the top, they have full irradiation, full likeness of whatever they actually want, and actually they get it and they are happy up there and they get high quality or high concentration of sugar. But then the, the higher the number of the fruit, the gradient and the concentration of the sugars drop almost immediately, while the lower number actually they keep having and reducing a bit of this gradient. So this variability affects quite a bit and we don't know how to, well, we, there are management issues that to try to overcome it. This, again, shows exactly the same thing, but in this case, similar trees, same trees actually, but we divided just the top and bottom. We wanted to see the two extremes. And instead we harvested that uh, commercial harvest. So we harvested with the grower and understanding of what actually was happening. And the only, we noticed that there was, again, no effect between top and bottom with the commercial, so medium, that means that what the grower was actually living on the trees or high crop load, those that didn't have any effect at all on sugars. The only, thing, the only one that had a bit of an effect was the top of the uh, low um, crop load, so less fruit at the top at the commercial harvest time, so the tree didn't have the time to actually go and continuously accumulate as much as possible. When we do the second harvest, then we noticed a bit of a difference. That was again along the entire scale, very similarly, that the top accumulated uh, much more sugars because they were actually hanging a week longer. So that becomes one of the important factors. Can we identify a method to hang this fruit longer and can we identify a method to take, pick and harvest this fruit at their optimum depending on where they need to go because the longer we leave them the better the accumulation of whatever actually we are looking. So how currently we do it? Normally, did it go down? No, okay. Normally it's firmness as an indicator of maturity or background color. But in this case, for example, firmness was not useful at all because the crop load was not affected. And it didn't, and the firmness of this fruit was actually similar. And how did we, could we figure out that it was actually being able to handle it longer? So normally people consider maturity at this point, but there is a no clear indication of what actually maturity is. So that is where comes in all of that. This was a bit of a long introduction, as you can see. This is a bit where our group comes in now with a new technology. We identify new technology to measure fruit maturity. However, 
Is it possible to actually have it along the chain? Because this is an important factor. If we are able to measure and identify fruit maturity only in, some, in certain particular steps of that uh, horticultural chain, the value chain we identified before, then we are, why do we need something new? We can keep whatever we have currently if we have the same problems. Anyway, this technology is coming from Italy, is a new, is a spectroscopy, practically, in the visible near-infrared spectroscopy. Uh, from the University of Bologna, and it measures the chlorophyll in the length of the chlorophyll A content in the mesocarp. So it's a couple of millimeters below the skin. So the skin color is actually not affecting the actual um, reading. And it becomes an index of physiological maturity stage, and it is proved for climateric fruit like stone or pond currently. It has been done and tried in other species, like we had a preliminary data on papaya, and it looks like actually it was working quite well. It seems working well in mangoes and in, well, mangoes that I know, that I'm aware of. So how does it actually work? It works that uh, there is a spectrum. Here you have an example of the spectrum of the, the between that uh, 670 and 720, where there is the absorption of the chlorophyll A, and so this you have that uh, different uh, maturity level, they have a different absorption because the chlorophyll is actually degrading during the, during the ripening due to the effect of the ethylene starting and uh, the entire process, and so at this point you can, it's possible to make a correlation. You can see here, more or less, that the top has, is less mature fruit than the bottom, so the lower the number, the more mature the fruit. So as, as, as I mentioned, the, this um, index of absorbance difference is related to the time course of ethylene production during the fruit ripening. So that means that it's actually a physiological stage. The fruit is actually behaving that, and it will always, because genetically, and being a climatary fruit, is stimulated to produce ethylene at a certain point whenever the fruit maturity is starting. This creates the possibility to segregate the fruit by certain classes, that they become constant every year, in the, during the years, and it's uh, independent of agronomical practices and uh, seasonality, this segregation in classes, because we do it through ethylene production. So we segregate the fruit by measuring and then put them in the chamber and whatever and so on and so on. We segregate the fruit by making this correlation with ethylene production and we are able to identify classes in where the, in where the ethylene is produced in a similar quantity. Those identified it, uh, practically they tell us that the fruit has a similar moment, is in a similar moment of, uh, along the uh, ripening process, the physiological ripening process, and therefore they can be segregated and put together. In this case, we have a nectarine, and we show the, the data for two different years. There is variability in the quantity of the ethylene produ produced, and that is due to the season, is due to treatments, is due to complete to a lot of other things. And in this particular case, was actually due to the 2010 was a very uh, raining year, and we had a huge amount of problems with uh, rot in the field and in post harvest. So this affected the production of ethylene from the fruit. But the general behavior is similar. In fact, you can see that here is when it actually starts in very small quantity in both years, where we have this one, but that I'm actually positive that that was actually fruit that they were, uh, they had um, some particular small wound. And then at this level as well, we have an increase. It starts the actual, let's see, okay. It starts, <laughs> okay. It starts <laughs> the exponential part of the production of the, of the ethylene. And so the classes are confirmed that they are consistent every, during the different years. What does this make? It makes that we can make correlations, and during this correlation, then segregating the fruit is able to actually identify a moment that we can actually really physiologically say at what stage 
is the fruit. It correlates this technology, if we want to be stuck a bit into the old fashioned ways that is the correlation with normal destructive measurements, for example, in pair Williams, there was quite a good correlation. I'm jumping around during the entire presentation between species of fruit for the simple reason that uh, to show that actually this technology, it is valuable, it is valid, and it is um, use, usable for different species. So for Per Williams, in this case, with um, firmness, there is quite a decent correlation. And as well for background colors, that they are ways of uh, the, the consumer, that the growers currently measures and identify the fruit maturity. However, when we go, for example, in this particular nectarine, in September red, the correlation uh, is not there that more, so it drops a bit. So it becomes a bit of a concept of uh, variety dependent. It becomes a bit variety dependent. However, these parameters and the drop and the, and the variability and the rate of change that they, they happen during maturity, during ripening and maturity process, they are variable by variety independently. Even the firmness changes the rate of, of uh, decay of for is variety dependent. So if we start having a things that they are completely variety dependent, do we need to be actually stuck in the, in the uh, old fashion of checking and continuously correlating to non-destructive? Or could we actually decide and use this new, this method of measuring an index of maturity along the entire chain? So can we verify that we can uncouple with everything we know till now and we simply identify and see the usefulness of this technology along each step of the horticultural chain. That, if you remember, we had the field, we had harvest, we had post-harvest, we had retailing, and then we had the consumer. The, the consumer, though, is the starting and end point of the entire chain. So in this case, let's try to see if they actually would work well in the field. And here we can, because it's non-destructive, measure completely and monitor in pairs, William and Lania. Lania is a pair produced from our department along the entire season. And I put on the right axis temperature. And you can see there was a nice lag in both the varieties when the temperature was higher than 35 degrees. We do know that, temp that palm fruit tend to do that, to shut down and, uh, stops the and, and stops, but we don't know exactly what's happening to maturity, and this we are able to identify. And in this particular case and that particular year, that was 2014, for both, for both varieties, the actual harvesting point was after the lag. But that lag of not increasing maturity for two weeks, if you go by calendar, and that's what the grower did the entire, that particular year, at this point, Williams, they would have harvested it. So they would have harvested fruit that was highly mature. And that actually what happened, because people, they didn't wait. They went by calendar, the fruit was hanging there, and yeah, okay, started to go in the shops, harvest. Quality, low. Because didn't, because if we hang the fruit a bit longer, it gets better quality. And so in this way, we would have been able to identify when to harvest it better. This is a nectarine, for example, in a summer flare on a different, uh, on, a, on a tatura trellis. And uh, in this case, it shows that uh, along the season, there was no difference between, between uh, in, there was no gradient in maturity in, between the fruit in the canopy, between top and bottom. So that tells to a grower that is able to identify and monitor their field, that is that w when it's time to harvest, can go and actually not really strip because there is always variability in a, in a, in a tree, so it always need more harvests. However, it can actually go along the entire tree. While we said before, well, we noticed before, and we noticed it here in the same experiment we had before in the vase and the crop loads, in another nectarine, very early variety nectarine, that instead different shape of the tree, different training actually affects the maturity level. But we are able to monitor it with this, with this new technology because it's non-destructive. So monitoring it in that way, 
we are able to identify and manage our orchard because then here says there are a couple of days difference between top and bottom and so that's what the grower has to identify and has to arrange and to, to their, their uh, uh, harvesting time and the management of their people. In Tatura trellis, would go along and harvest continu uh, continuously while in a different shape I probably need to stagger even the position in the tree of when it needs to harvest, therefore more harvests. But it's identifiable and it can be manageable. Crop load has a similar effect. High and medium, high and medium they seem that, seems that higher than a certain qu uh, quantity of fruit on a tree that it's not affected too much. In fact, the high and medium uh, crop loads they were very similar, but uh, the low crop load, so lo less fruit that they matured faster. It and this, again, is something that the grower can identify. We can monitor it, we can identify, we can react to it. We can predict. In fact, there is several literature, there is, yeah, there is literature around and in international research that actually was able to create the sort of rules and the protocol to try to make a prediction according very early in the season, starting early in the season, because the theory is that below a certain point of a certain value of the IAD index, of the index of absorbance difference, the ripening in the fruit, in stone fruit at least, is happening as a straight line. And here we, uh, we tried it and we, s we saw if it was actually true and it comes out that this we, we were able to verify these particular aspects. Still, and is able to, still, there are, the, it's maintained the similar effect that we had before, so the two, three days difference between the, the crop load, but it is possible to predict it, and so the, the growers can very, in, in advance, identify what actually, when it could be the optimal harvest, depending on what they want to do with this fruit. Here is, we actually tried it, and so we applied after very early in the season, after two or three measurements uh, that we started, and um, we applied the, the, the regression line practically, and we continued, and uh, we noticed that there was quite a good correlation between the measured time, the measured, not the, the measured values, uh, the one that was actually showed before, here, for example, the, the predicting line according the regression line according to all of the data, and the one that in the green was actually the, was actually prepared was actually um, obtained by um, practically making a straight line after the first four measures, three four measurements. So we can predict. There is a lot of interaction. The level of prediction and the level of difficulties and interaction can be between, for example, crop load, top and bottom, and all of the different aspects that you can find in a field. That is up to the grower, but we have the methodology. We have the possibility. This is able to start managing and deciding what to do early in the season, and the seasonality of the, of the uh, particular variety is actually quite affecting it, meaning that uh, very early varieties, they have the, the window to predict that what their harvest could be becomes shorter and shorter because, as you can see, it is actually they have 80 days after full bloom, 80, 84, 85 days uh, after full bloom, so it becomes very short, the period of possible identification, but the varieties that they go a bit longer, the, then it becomes better predictor and actually much longer time to be able to manage. And this is another, another example on how to, uh, that uh, by monitoring uh, with the DA meter and with uh, this uh, new index uh, in the field, the ripening, it's possible to monitor and again predict. In this case, was we were trying the effect of irrigation, so uh, deficit irrigation stress on the tree, and we noticed that, that uh, deficit irrigation, even a small one by 25%, that is not the high stress, honestly, um, was able to actually delay the, the ripening up to two, three days, while instead of severe stress was able to delay the ripening up to almost a week. 
So again, it's another method of uh, monitoring uh, what is happening in the field. Uh, that uh, we know there is a special variability due to um, position, due to different soil, and so there are patches of dryness. There are several aspects uh, that they can change what is happening in the field of ratio of uh, water that get ratioed, and all of these possibilities. But again, we are able to monitor and we are able to decide what to do and in real time with that fruit. That is the most important aspect. However, in this, for example, in this case, in Gala, um, it's divided in uh, the, the different classes of maturity and that possible storability that we got in that case was an info information early on that we got from growers that they actually were saying well we, we harvest this fruit that usually we deliver it and it has this possibility this storability uh, in, in post harvest and so we set out to try to actually verify that because that is our next step till now we were able to identify and prove that this technology is able to give an indication a really good indicator and in monitoring and a decisional aspects in the field pre-harvest and up to harvest. So now we have the next step that is what to do with that fruit. So would it be as good once the fruit is harvested and removed from the tree and therefore we have to remember this, when we remove the fruit from the tree it becomes a wound for that fruit. So the ripening process starts, the, the ethylene process starts, all of that starts independently. The fruit can be totally immature, but it will start, it will become soft after a certain period. It will have all of these particular aspects and particular physiological uh, processes that they will happen. So does it work in post-harvest once the fruit is removed? And again, that is the I don't know, did I show it before? Yeah, well, then this is the machine, very small, relatively small, as you can see in, uh, in the hands, and it requires uh, to measure the fruit on both cheeks, like you would do the firmness, for example. And um, it takes a measurement, it takes a, 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 an average, and it gives you, delivers this uh, um, index, and through that one, we are able to identify, monitor, and everything. So, would it be good in post-harvest as well as in pre-harvest to be able to continue the decision aspect or that is fundamental for our new concept of having a value chain instead of a production or a supply chain? So we need to manipulate continuously if we really want to deliver this kind of chain. And so, would it work in post-harvest? Well, we were able to we se segregate the fruit is the first thing that we need to identify because the, the different to monitor the different behavior of the fruit. And as you can see, it actually is quite good in segregation of the fruit in according to their values. Wouldn't that be nice if you actually find that kind of segregation on your shelf when you go in a supermarket to actually buy the fruit? Instead of trying to identify in any kind of way, some way to separate them when it's the mess that is current. And so that's where the high variability is. Simply by doing that, and this technology is applicable on a packing line, so it is possible to actually separate it like that, wouldn't that be nice, for example? This is pear. We go back to Lania, that is one of the uh, pear varieties that our um, department bred. This was at uh, shelf life, 18 degrees, monitored the, uh, their, uh, their um, the um, ID decay in t during time. We had four different uh, classes, maturity classes in this case. We had a very immature, that one I called immature with the blue line, is a very immature. So that means that is totally no ethylene production. And it was a stone, not a stone fruit. It was actually a stone, a piece of rock. It was so hard and bad. <laughs> it would really was immature, in fact, above 1.6 in the IDA index, while was 1.1 should, should have been the ideal time to harvest. And then we had a second that we decided was an early peak, because independently of what you say, in pairs, growers, they harvest early. There's, 
no way to try currently to change their mind. We try, with this new technology, we try to change their mind, but it's stronger than them when it goes a certain time, the harvest. So we added that particular class that is still immature, there's still no ethylene production, so the process, the ripening process still didn't start. While the commercial harvest, that is what there is a start of ethylene production. It's very low. It's a really, really small production of ethylene. We are talking in parts per billions, 10, 20 parts per billions, something like that. And then we have the ready to eat, what is at the moment when it starts the um, exponential parts. And so then we are going in parts per millions. So we have these kind of levels of change. And this is, uh, is respected later on, and as you can see here, in actually their behavior in post harvest as well when we monitor it. That dotted line for us was when we started to notice some deterioration of the fruit and some, um, some small defect. And so for, uh, for, for that is, there is some defect, that's it, for us was the fruit after that one is not good enough. And so it could be a cutting point. And the timing when they reach it is completely different. And so as you can see, it could actually be predictable. This was a monitoring, but can, we, can it actually be followed through completely? And can it actually be predicted depending on when you were able to harvest that fruit? The moment you identify, you can classify, you can segregate it, can I actually decide how long and define how long it stays, or it could stay, and so I can decide my market, where to send that fruit depending on the level of ripeness where I harvested it. So we set out to do an experiment on it, and we try to see a different uh, effect of uh, temperature. Here again, I'm showing some um, stone fruit. So different aspect of temperature and length and interaction between uh, the different maturity classes. So the fruit segregated by what we showed before, the maturity classes through the IAD. And we tried to fit, we did a fitting exercise with our data, where we kept the maturity class and the storage temperature as a sub-data set. In this particular case, we used the sigma plot. That is, I find it is a very nice uh, software for uh, regression fitting. And we used a new, a new feature, let's call it, that is this global curve fitting that allows to identify some particular aspect and to create uh, these sub-data sets that uh, they, 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 where you can decide the commonality of some of the aspects of parameters of the curve itself. So uh, you create a sub-data set, but the part of a full set to be able to give you a curve that is valid for all of them, but it could take still in consideration the single aspects of your sub-data set. So in this case, we have temperature and storage length storage temperature, sorry, and cla well, maturity classes as sub-data sets. And then we had the parameter B in the curve slope that is, uh, that, uh, is the, the curve slope, and so that becomes this sort of a ratio of decay. So it comes out that actually it is pretty possible to identify a common behavior of the fruit in post-harvest. And it comes out that this a sigmoidal logistic curve so there, is, there was someone else that was, uh, confirms one particular other work in uh, literature that we found that said a similar thing, was related, not completely, but practically said very similar results. So then that it is that DA did, uh, decays in post-harvest with a sigmoidal curve with a logistic model. So when we have the um, A is the intercept, so the ID value, so the, the, the average of that uh, class, maturity class. The T is the storage, and the, then we have the, in, the inflection point when the curve starts, when the curve start to curve again, and from a straight point, <laughs> because it's an S, sort of an S curve. And so, oops, missed one. As a result, it comes out that uh, the temperature and um, the, the, the variety, the, no, the maturity class, they do actually affect 
the rate of decay of the um, maturity of the fruit. However, it is the same curve. It, has, it is a common curve. It is all of it. The, the curve is the sigmoidal logistic with three parameters: a different shape, different shape due to temperature mostly in this case, and maturity class, and variety. So again, it becomes a bit of a uh, variety dependent. But everything is at the end of the day variety dependent. And once you are able to identify it for one variety once, then that becomes what practically you, you could have your model. So we can see that there are particular aspects that they are changed by, and I'm not a mathematician, and this is the maximum I can get and I can do, but it can be taken further from here. You can see that there is a very high descriptor of the curve uh, so this sigmoidal curve, see at the top, from each of the three varieties that we tested it on, it has quite a good descriptor, an R square of over 80, with, uh, when we start talking about hundreds of data, that's quite a good result. But then we notice particular aspect that they are actually changed by the temperature and the maturity class. For example, the first thing that we notice is that temperature affects the inflection point. So the lower the temperature, the higher the inflection point. But it changes during, for, uh, there is an effect of variety in there as well. So it's not so straightforward. However, there are particular rules that we notice this one. So, and as well as we notice, for example, that the fitting of the curve itself, it uh, changes a bit by maturity class, is able to fit better depending on the maturity classes. That's where it comes, the effect of the maturity, uh, the segregation and the starting point itself. And as you can see that we have the B value, that was the value that was common for all of them, so this shows that there is one curve describing it, and this was the best curve that we were able to find. And at the end of the day, I'm not able to, but I, but, uh, I believe that uh, with a bit of mathematical effort, it could be possible to try to actually predict and identify a pattern on how the temperature and the, and the maturity class actually is affecting the change of these parameters to be able to actually make a much better predicting and fitting model. But to really deliver, completely on this part in this if we want to really consider the various aspects uh, during post harvest especially there are quite a bit of disorders especially chilling injury disorders or simply uh, storage disorders for in this case for example flash browning would it be possible to identify or simply create patterns or identify patterns of behavior so therefore again we can try to take decisions because we know what could happen during this period so in this case, for example, we have two different, um, we have a nectarine and a peach, and we, try, we kept uh, this fruit for quite a longer period of time, so between 28 and 42 days at two different temperatures. And it turns out that the maturity class actually does affect the browning. So the, the less immature fruit, it actually has less browning in the nectarine in this case. And obviously, the longer you keep it in storage, the longer, the higher is the, is the problem that, you, that you're going to have the disorder in the percentage. And the temperature, the higher the temperature, the higher the uh, disorder. But again, as we said, it is possible to identify it because the segregation, once you segregate your fruit by maturity through this value, through this uh, index, then you're able to classify and you're able to Predict maybe is a big word, but you are able to have an idea of what could actually happen to your fruit when you, depending on the condition you are actually storing it. And for the for September sun, the peach instead was the opposite. That actually the uh, effect of browning, so the incidence of browning was actually decreasing with the maturity class. So again, we get we get this 
variety effect, but that is, would be anyway, and would always be there. And so it needs to be identified, but still, that doesn't remove the effectiveness of what actually is the uh, measurement. And, uh, for example, it is possible to identify, again, the maturity classes, a possible um, eating quality. In this case, we did a sugar to acid ratio that is very common as an indicator of consumer preference. And um, it gives this value, the higher the value, the higher the preference for the consumers. So we go back to those four classes of pairs that we showed before when we were showing the, the post-harvest DKA. And we had very mature, so that was a rock, and then we had the immature still, so that was the early peak that was still no production of ethylene, so it still didn't start on the fruit, on the tree, when it was removed from the tree, the ripening process at all. So there was no ethylene production completely. And then we had the commercial with a very small part per billion production of ethylene, and the ready to eat where it starts to be part per million. And as you can see, so the blue, the immature, was the lowest grade at any time at harvest during storage, and it actually went worse because the fruit was just becoming softer, but it was actually not good at all in, uh, um, in, in this sugar to acid ratio. So sugar didn't increase and the, and the acid didn't increase, so it was actually quite a bad fruit even to look at and taste. However, for example, the early peak, the immature, the immature there was no production of ethylene at harvest, but after five days, it, was, it reached a potential likability by consumers similar to the classes that they were actually already in, uh, they already started at harvest the ripening process. So this tells us that uh, if you know how your fruit was, you wouldn't put that fruit directly on the supermarket shelf after harvest because it needs a few days of ripening before it becomes likable. Then again, you can reduce your variability at this point because you were able to identify how your fruit was actually in this uh, um, the value uh, in uh, correspondence to their ethylene production and their segregation in maturity. And therefore, you would be able to take a real-time decision. So in this case, wait four or five days before putting it on the supermarket because otherwise the consumers will not like it. While the commercial, and the ready to eat, obviously the ready to eat was the best at harvest. And then it starts to reduce the meat. It's still very high and good, considered good, because it had the, all the best qualities when it was harvested. So they had the highest sugars, it had the best color, it had the higher, it had all of the quality because it hanged longer on the tree, so it was actually tasted simply better. And so it can decrease the meat because the softness. So it started, there was a bit of soft, uh, a bit of a decay starts being in decay. In fact, we didn't have those classes at the 15 days. They didn't last that long. But it is possible to segregate your fruit and identify what the consumer could be and could do with those fruit. And again, once you define that one, you have everything. Because at that point, you are able to identify all the different steps and you are able to rebring and decide in real time what to do. So in post harvest, we were able to identify the decays of the IAD index uh, that as a model logistic regression with cultivar, but this would be, I expect, we still have to find it, we still have to prove it, but I expect that it could actually be for other fruit as well. So cultivar temperature and maturity class could affect the regression parameters. And we can predict or define the potential consumer acceptance. It could be predictable and identifiable by the maturity index. And therefore, it could actually be really taken along the entire, the, all the steps in the uh, commercial, in the uh, value chain. It will need to be quite a bit more work especially mathematical work, to be able to make a fully predictable model, especially if you want to in insert the uh, disorders effect and all of the other aspects. But I do believe that there is the possibility to really make a predictable model for the horticultural industry. 
So the fruit maturity as an IAD, as an IAD index, could become the common denominator to monitor the quality, to determine the next step, not only the next step, to determine all of the steps and the future of all the fruit from the field to actually the consumer. Because at any step in all of the different actors that they are uh, into, the, into the value chain in this case, they can identify what is the fruit, their future, and what is actually could be done. And this becomes fundamental when you want to go toward market access, market choice, and the export. When you have to keep three weeks your fruit on a fry uh, by sea, you are able to identify it and you are able to predict it. And this methodology does it, this technology does it, this possibility give you this possibility. Other technologies not because most of the time they are non-destructive, they are destructive and therefore we have all the different problems that we were mentioning before. So as a conclusion, the usefulness along the supply chain is in pre-harvest because we can understand the orchard, we can optimize the agronomical practices, we can reduce the number of peaks, we can reduce the, therefore the fruit variability, we can identify as a prediction tool the harvest windows and we have we can, uh, we can decide to harvest at the correct time for the chosen market. In post-harvest, we have similar aspects. Uh, we, have, we can monitor maturity for the storage fruit. We can determine shelf life potential and length of storage. The, um, we can sort the fruit according to maturity, depending, so we can actually act differently on those fruit. The, uh, in post-harvest treatments, like something like uh, controlled atmosphere, 1 MCP, maturity retardants, and so on and so ever that is, could be necessary. We can increase the market flexibility knowing when you harvested your fruit and uh, reduce the variability because we can decide at any time what to do with that fruit and we can increase at the end the consumer satisfaction. We currently have several projects in which we are testing this, uh, this uh, technology. We are extensively use this technology to maintain and continue trying to produce protocols, practical protocols for growers to capitalize as much as possible from this uh, technology and the concept of maturity to create this um, value chain. So we have several aspects, several uh, projects uh, trying to increase uh, Sugar, sugar content, reduce the, the um, variability intra-canopy and between trees. We try to do that through rootstock, um, tree training, so tree shape, and uh, interaction with the crop load. In post-harvest, we have several projects as well. We try to determine protocol to predict storage length, to test in vitors and how it actually relates and if it's able to identify correctly and monitor correctly the uh, fruit ripening when uh, it's uh, subjected to controlled atmosphere or 1MCP in different fruit pairs at the moment. We want to expand it to apples for sure. Um, we have tried to correlate it with our different aspects of quality, like in this case aroma in pre and post harvest or uh, fruit ripening enzymes. And we are trying to expand the, uh, the consumer preference for, um, to identify what is the level, what is the number of the consumer that prefers the particular fruit, and therefore we can backtrack everything from there. We still need uh, quite a bit of research because, as we said, it's a, vari it's a variety aspect, so it is variety dependent, so the identification of the classes needs to be done by gas chromatographer, but it needs to be done only once. There is still, we are scientists, so we need to verify protocol and um, all the different uh, um, aspects uh, of uh, the production lines uh, through different, sp to different species in pre and post harvest. We need to try to correlate the IAD with different aspects of physiology because what I showed was for climatary fruit, but not all the fruit is actually climatary. And not only, there are some fruit that actually do not produce ethylene at the harvest. So they do ripen, they do soften, they do produce, they, they do follow a uh, pattern of uh, ripening, but they do not produce ethylene. So how do we segregate in that case? So there is the need to create a, a different uh, 
physiological parameter on which to correlate the DA, and that can be I don't know, the enzymes, as I said before, or it could be any other aspect of uh, uh, molecular biology or mo molecularly done. And the good thing is that it is actually possible through the machine to really segregate your fruit and to make this correlation perfect because you can pick the fruit only at that particular value. So there is no confusion anymore on that you find in literature that is usually is of similar fruit of similar but similar maturity taken because they were harvested on the same day, that doesn't mean anything, or they had a similar um, fairness on the fruit we destroyed, but we didn't use those because we destroyed them. And so <laughs> this makes a much better correlation even to study particular, several aspects of physiology of the fruit itself. We need to identify more consumer responses, and so we need to create a fully predictive model for the value chain. So in conclusion, this DA technology allows a rapid and accurate measurement of fruit maturity along the whole chain, providing a consistent quality that would meet consumer expectation. And it could allow for a good entrepreneur to build a brand of guaranteed quality. And with this, I conclude, and I thank you very much. And if there is any question, I will be happy to.